Hey everyone, my name is Josh. Welcome back to Saving Green, your channel for practical advice on sustainable living and technology. Today we're going to talk about a trend that seems to be a theme of late. It's a strategy employed by the largest energy and utility company and service providers across the country, including FPNL, my local provider, to make rooftop solar less economical by changing how the power generated by rooftop solar is reimbursed. Not the most exciting topic, I'll give you that. but. Just hear me out. See, a lot of consumer and retail solar panel users utilize a system of buying and selling kilowatt hours of energy back and forth to the grid. This is called net metering. As a current solar power owner, I pay a monthly service fee to allow FPNL to monitor my energy usage on a daily basis. Any extra energy produced by my system is sold back to the grid at a one to one kilowatt hour ratio. Any extra power I need from the grid, I pay for. So some months I owe money, and some months I generate extra credit to be applied for future billing cycles. It's a win-win. Basically, the value of each kilowatt hour, which is dependent on usage, has a certain predetermined price. That's the amount of money we pay FPNL for the equivalent unit of electricity. You can check with your local utility company to see if they use a peak pricing model based on demand throughout the day, or a system where the cost is pretty constant like here in Florida. Your utility bill should break all that down for you each month. So why use net metering? Well, it's the most efficient way to utilize solar power generation. It ensures all the energy is used and it lessens the strain on the grid since the grid is smart enough, in theory, to distribute the power where it's needed the most at any given time. It requires less resources from the central power plants. It decreases transmission line thermal losses. And of course, it promotes clean energy. Also, it obviates the need for large battery backups like Tesla's Powerwall, which are costly and still carbon intensive to manufacture. I have some videos on lithium ion batteries for you to check out up here. Okay, well that's all well and good, but what's FPNL trying to do? Well, the problem is that FPNL has lobbied two state officials, one Republican congressman and one Republican senator, to support House Bill 741 and Senate Bill 1024, respectively. They're the same bill in each chamber. This bill explicitly disincentivizes solar usage by discounting the price of those aforementioned energy credits being sold back to the grid. It's very similar to a failed petition to the FERC or Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to change the national payment scheme to wholesale rates for net metering back in 2020. That suit was brought by the NERA, a lobbying group representing New England coal and gas suppliers. I have a video about that effort and more general information about the history of net metering up here if you want to check that out. As I mentioned, that bill did not pass. Now, getting back to this particular bill, it's drafted by FPL lobbyists to fundamentally change how net metering is priced to add more fees and reduced reimbursement for solar owners. Let's look at the language a bit more closely, shall we? Here we see that the aim is to revise the net metering structure by a certain date, in this case, July 1st, 2022, just about six months from now. In section one, they pretty transparently soften language from promote to continue the development of renewable energy resources. You see how that word was literally stricken out? Then they justify the rate reductions due to the development and maturation of the solar energy industry, yet also stating a few lines later that this quote, mature industry is also not available to most of the public. And therefore, those who can't get solar shouldn't have to subsidize those who can afford it. So solar owners, quote, pay the full cost of electric service and are not cross-subsidized by the public utilities general body of ratepayers. Okay, so here's the meat of the change. Solar users will still purchase energy from the public utility at the public utility's retail rate, and all the energy delivered by the customer owner or lease generation to the public utility is credited to the customer at the public utilities full avoided costs. Plus, they put in some extra opaque language like monthly minimums, etc. In other words, they're buying back the power based on the opportunity cost of not sending it out in the first place. So here's an example. Let's say a supermarket gets a bushel of apples for three cents each from the farmer. The grocer in turn sells me seven apples at 10 cents each. But later that day, I realized I actually don't need all those apples since I picked two from my tree at home, so I only need five. 
When I return those two apples back to the store, assuming you can return produce, the grocer gives me six cents instead of 20, since that's the price he would have paid for the apples based on his cost from the farmer. It just makes no sense and is totally different from every other retail transaction. So how do we know FPNL is really behind this new bill? Well, the Miami Herald and Orlando Sentinel did some crackerjack reporting to expose several potential scandals that have led to this situation. And I'll link to those articles if you want to check those out. But I do have a few juicy morsels for you. Do not worry. Number one, FPNL basically asked State Senator Jennifer Badley to sponsor this bill. That was drafted again by FPL lobbyists, after which she was rewarded coincidentally with a $10,000 donation to her political committee, Women Building the Future. Uh, but of course, this donation by Associated Industries, a political arm of FPNL's parent company, NextEra, was not given to her campaign with any expectation of favor. Of course not. And of course, the senator herself denies any correlation. Number two, FPNL orchestrated a scheme to prop up ghost candidates in 2020 to dilute votes from an environmentalist Democrat, former Senator Jose Javier Rodriguez, who ended up losing the election by 32 votes. In March of 2021, Frank Artiles, or Artiles, a former Republican state rep who resigned in disgrace from office in 2017, was arrested on fraud charges and campaign finance violations after receiving allegedly nearly three million in dark money that was traced to people tied to FPNL in connection to this scheme. Nonetheless, this helped ensure Republican control of all the branches of Florida state government in 2020. Number three, FPNL backed a failed ballot amendment in 2016 that would have added fees and barriers to rooftop solar. And number four, perhaps the most salacious and ridiculous, a man named Theodore Hayes received a trove of emails in November of 2019 from a political consultant working for FPNL on how they can siphon money through a network of shell companies and nonprofits to make campaign donations around the country to minimize all public reporting of entities and activities. And who was Theodore Hayes? Well, he was the CEO of FPNL, and his real name is Eric Salagi. I'm not making any of this up. Here's a picture of the guy right here. And if all that wasn't enough, the state legislature recently approved a huge rate hike for FPNL customers to account for the rising cost of natural gas for all users, not just solar, over the next four years. And that's already done. This new bill is designed to squeeze even more revenue from the 1% of solar users like me. So let's break this down even more. They argue giving full retail credit is having everyone subsidize the cost of solar panels. That's absurd. In fact, we take a huge capital outlay to pay for solar panels and insulation, plus we pay an extra utility connection fee to opt into net metering. Furthermore, it's our neighbors who benefit from our power generation since we're technically increasing the supply of electricity. It's basic economics. Also, public incentives towards green or new technologies are necessary at times. The fact that FPNL is crying foul of some public subsidizing of rooftop solar is only an issue because it's affecting their bottom line. This is a solution in search of a problem. Not to mention the fact that this will really hurt local solar distributors and installers, further reducing competition and hurting small businesses. Also. Any mass adoption claimed from FPNL to shift towards renewables is slow, partial, and misleading. In fact, in this piece published by The Invading Sea, Dave Reuter, on behalf of FPNL, claims that the quote 42 solar power plants they already have is three times more cost effective than rooftop solar. Yes, there are efficiencies gained by economies of scale, but these 42 plants account for a paltry 1.5% of the FRCC grid per the EPA, that's the local region seen here in Florida. As you can see, this region has a far higher proportion of coal and natural gas than the national average. But it is true that emissions per megawatt hour are comparable and slightly less than the national average for CO2 and significantly cleaner for particulates like sulfur dioxide and nitrous oxide compounds. But to claim that FPNL is a green energy company is wholly misleading and inaccurate, despite their laudable efforts like introducing the world's largest solar battery last month, which I commend. Lastly, the relative value of these, quote, solar subsidies they seek to reclaim by this change, which by their own assessment is around $30 million per year, amounts to less than 1% of their total profits. Remember, they are already expecting an increase in revenue 
over the next four years, paid for by Florida residents from those already approved rate hikes. Oh, and in the wake of all this reporting, last week FPL published a scathing criticism of the Miami Herald reporter who's been breaking these stories, with a hit piece against the paper saying their refusal to publish FPNL's unedited op-ed was unethical, and accused the paper of manipulating public opinion against them. Here's a link to their statement entitled, Truth Matters, so you can make your own judgments. Now look, this issue fortunately doesn't really affect me, as I'll be grandfathered in to my current contract for 10 years after the proposed effects will take place. But that's not the point. The people of Florida, and everywhere for that matter, should be aware of what their government is doing, who's lining their pockets, and what the utility company is doing behind the scenes, and how profits are yet again superseding the interests of the people of Florida and the environment in which we live. However, with this legislation in limbo, now may be the best time to take the plunge on solar, and I have a whole playlist and resources to help you determine if it's a good choice for you. I'll link to those up here. Also on the screen and in the description below is a petition to send your local and state reps your comments on this matter. It's through savesolar.org and it's an easy way to get your voices heard with pre-drafted templates. And speaking of sounding off, let me know what your thoughts are about what FPNL has been up to in the comments below. As always, thanks for your time and please like this video and share it with others so more people can shine light on this shady behavior. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.